find their way through time and space Words and put me by your side cast out through space or in this world of wibbling I try my best to let you see this love I have Hey guys, how's your story going today? Oh, there's somebody here. Look at that. We got somebody watching. Yay. Is it past 420? Did you have your break? Some of you know what that means. If you're my age, I'm out here trying to go ahead and cover a few more things because um, as the world of illusion and delusion rages on, um, and we mount our efforts to get to March 4th with some sort of hope that will probably be dashed, much like the last few. Um, but hope reigns eternal. That's our motto. We never give up. Never, ever, ever give up. Paradise is on the shore, right? Uh, anyway, in the meantime, if you're not paying attention, earthquakes, volcanoes, uh, enormous amounts of pressure. Hey, and you know what? We found out we actually have pictures of it from satellites. If you believe in satellites and all that good stuff, I kind of do. Of a solar, a, a, a cosmic tornado over the North Pole. And it's this giant plasma. Um, if you look at a 2D slice of plasma, you're going to see this swirl, like a rope coming in. And you can see it at the North Pole. Okay, rolling now. It's only 2.20 here. Holy cow. Where are you at, Shannon? Oh, my goodness. It's 4.51 over here. Hmm. <laughs> um, oh, my goodness. Uh, Marlin Manifest. That's a good new name. I haven't seen that one before. Shannon, welcome. Um, the uh, the thing that's going on right now with that solar tornado is kind of cool. If you want to watch a beautiful picture, it's in um, my one of my favorite colors, in a violet, a purple. And it's swirling over the North Pole. And it actually took a, as it hits the planet, um, coming out of the North Pole, you can see the footprint of what would affect to be a 2D slice of a plasma rope coming into the planet, hitting and bombarding with massive amounts of electrons, of course, which is a wonderful thing if you want those. Um, but what's interesting is about it is it's rotating counterclockwise to the atmosphere of the planet and the rotation of the planet. So you wonder, how did, just for a mental exercise in the world of wibblery and stuff, how did Pluto's atmosphere reverse? Did the rotation of the planet reverse to just the atmosphere reverse and it doesn't make a difference? I, they both make a difference. Yeah, suddenly the winds went from west to east instead of east to west. That makes a difference. It's going to make the waves grow. Everything else goes different. Everything goes different. But let's suppose what would do that. Now, suppose you take a gigantic plasma, 600 mile wide rope, like a tornado, calling it a hurricane, but it's a tornado. And basically it's spinning and it comes in there and it just twists literally so strongly in the opposite direction that it might potentially affect your um, electromagnetic charge. What do you think? And on top of that, it's coming in with some pressures on the planet of maybe uh, 700 kilometers per second, which sounds like an incredible amount of force on the front of us. Bow shock is huge. And our shields, Scotty, how are the shields doing? Scotty? You guys seen Scotty lately? You remember Star Trek? He's supposed to be taking care of our shields. He may be sleeping down there with uh, the bid on in the basement. I don't know, but luckily, somebody's watching our ass in because we're getting more, actually more wind speed off the back end, if you look at the models, and um, it's coming from someplace else on the back end of us. Isn't that sweet? Yeah, on our butts. Don't you like to have your butt heated up? So the wind's coming at us from the rear, traveling at a million and a half kilometers an hour, faster than we're traveling through outer space at our 40,000 miles an hour, plus, 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 plus. And so that's causing some interesting plasma reactions on the backside of our planet that we normally wouldn't get. Now, for all you that are paying attention to these things off the planet that are affecting on the planet, more than human beings, California, okay, out there in California, oh, you're getting the, oh, you guys get a nice dose of all this stuff. Fresh off the ocean. For your pleasure, go to thewindymap.com just for an exercise in mind thought. 
and pull up uh, wendy.com, go down the left corner and click on the button and it'll pull up a whole menu. And in the menu, you pull up particle matter, PM, particulates, and 2.5, which are really hard on the lungs. You can't get them out, they stick, they cause cancer, all those kind of things. Take a look, if you live in California, it's a really good um, minute by minute overview of four, five, six times what you should be taking in for a dosage of these particulates in an average day. And if you get over a certain amount, you're pretty much assured you're gonna get cancer. It's just a matter of when, not if. Kind of like riding a motorcycle. It's not if you got in an accident on your motorcycle, and I've ridden a motorcycle, it's when you get in your accident and how well you do if you survive your accident. But you're going to get in an accident if you ride a motorcycle. It's just part of living it. So you always ride as if you're aware there's going to be an accident. Now, if you live in California, well, you got so many good things to be aware of, I can't even begin to measure them. But down here in Texas, we got our own too. Everybody does. In fact, you're sending us your earthquakes, California. Please take them back. Luckily, most of them are going through Oklahoma. But, you know, we've had more earthquakes coming through here, even in Nixon, 70 miles from me, they're having earthquakes. And over in West Texas, where they do a lot of drilling, all this fracking they did, well, they kind of seems to be similar places. You know what I mean. So this new one that just hit in Oklahoma, and again, going toward the New Madrid, which is shifting. And anybody's not familiar with these terms, please go back to school, autodidactic, the concept of teaching yourself things that they didn't teach you in school, because if they taught you these things in school, they scared the crap out of you, and you said, Lord, Jesus, please save me, uh, because you almost think that's what you got to have, and you know what? It's easier once you do. That's just an opinion, and uh, so as we try to go through this next list, I wanted to do is there's been some misconceptions about how much does a house weigh, and how big of a house do you need, and how many big houses do you need to make a little village? I'm taking a deep breath. How many people here? Not the regulars. There's some uh, bets is here. Good. No. I don't know. That. There's a lot, a lot of things the, the elders can teach people. It's really important. And what I'm trying to do is, even though I know I look like I'm an, a kid, just a young kid, I'm a little closer to being an elder. I'm looking at them really close. I'm looking at their rear pockets really close. Like they can reach out and touch those 70 year olds' pockets. I'm so close. So what I want to do is try to transfer some of this knowledge and wisdom while we're still lucid and we can do these things. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. I was always told I wouldn't be that way by now. Lucid or crazy? I'm saying, I don't know. Some of those things, I don't know. Some of those things I never was told I was. So anyway, the nice thing about being a uh, talking head in cyberspace is that as I read these things out to you, the few that are here, I can know in the future, I can read the future, more people will see this than are seeing it right now. Absolutely. Unless, of course, YouTube steals it once more and does not allow me to download my copy of my own creation, like the last three out of five. So, we may see this end, guys, this relationship we have, this beautiful, loving relationship of me coming out here and talking to y'all face to face. Face to face. My face <laughs> can't see your face. Wait a second. Oh, wait a second. Oh, I see one face in the top, two faces in the top. Oh, those are such tiny little holes. Like a little tiny little images up there. Weird faces too. Whoa. Here's the thing about webbling. Keep this in mind. Webbling. That's getting on the internet and communicating through the webs. And the webs can reach out all the way across the universe, guys. It ain't just Earth. Problem is, you don't get to go ahead and talk back. It's like going to China. Yo, yo, you're censored. Well, when you leave planet, you're censored. When you're on planet, you're censored. Why? Because you can't know what you can't know. What would you do if you knew what was going on on the moon? Huh? You think you'd feel better? Would that make you feel good? Oh. Most people can't handle it. Would it help to know if somebody said, yeah, God, he engineered you all a little while back. Yeah, he did, he did. He injured a whole bunch of things, dropped them all down here. The experiment's going cool, except Petri dish is getting kind of contaminated. Just like it always does. You know, it's an experiment. It's a cycle. It's like democracy. You just go with it until all of a sudden, yeah, this, this kind of stinks. Did somebody not take care of this? Did the temperature get wrong? What happened, man? We had such a really good, a really good bunch of fungus was growing here. And it was all nice and clean and clean. It's all contaminated now. What happened? 
Is somebody smoking in the lab? Somebody get some smoke in here, man. There's something wrong with our, our, our experiment. Hey, Helene. Yeah, there's something wrong with the experiment, guys. It's something's rotten in Denmark. And, and it comes down to the issue of, you know what happens when you have one apple starts to rot or one cucumber starts to rot? One of anything vegetable starts to rot. It starts giving off a gas. And this gas causes everything uh, around it to rot faster. So if you don't get that one thing that's rotting, producing this particular wonderful gas that helps other things then deteriorate and move back toward nature's seeding process and nurturing process and dissolving process and rotting process, just like humans do and everything else does when it dies. Except when a vegetable does that, it affects everything around it. Now, I, with the exception of the movie that shows them carrying around this corpse for a few days, which is really funny for people that have extremely funny senses of humor, like they do a bit on, isn't that, oh, he's still alive. Kind of. I hear rumors, though. I'm not sure. But anyway, let's just suppose that the commie wasn't behind him turning the dial on one side and his wife wasn't behind him turning the dial on the other side and he could actually stand there and operate on his own for a few minutes without winding down and not being able to read. And if you had something like that for a president, oh, my God, what a country you'd have, huh? Whew. But luckily, we don't. We have a wonderful, wonderful country, and this is a fantasy thing I'm talking about, a distraction of one of the dreams that Darby has while he's trying to get the point across. And you're ready. How do you load a trailer? How do you make sure you got enough? <sighs> okay, so the point is this. Somebody wants to go ahead and get three, four, five, six houses. Well, I'll give you up to six houses, five, maybe six houses. You see how you're doing as you go. Because you only pick up so much. You only put so much together. And if you do it together and put it together right, and I expect it with my little phone. See, I can come over there and look in your phone. I can look out of your phone. I can see everything you're doing, just like the government does. Oh, you didn't know about that? And I'm going to ask permission. The government doesn't have to do that. But I'm going to ask permission. You're going to let me come through and look through your little hole in the front of your camera right up there. And I'm going to look back and I'm going to say, hey, yeah, that's a really rotten job you're doing right there. How about tearing all that off and redoing it? Because otherwise, I don't want to have my name on that piece of crap. And they're going to go, what? You hurt my feelings. And I want to Okay, so you did really good on your first one because that's the quality and that's the way you want to do it. And so you're going to build doghouse. No, it's first people... So, the education process is you want to get people to help you. You want to get people to help you build and do it right. If you go out there and just do it wrong, slap something together that I'd be ashamed of, that you ought to be ashamed of, but you just don't know, well, then I'm going to teach you. And if you don't like the way I teach, you may not like and get your feelings hurt, like people try to do to me all the time, because I don't do what they want me to do. Except mine is, is a very positive thing. I want to actually make you like a drill sergeant would do it right so that you don't hurt yourself later, so that you don't stab yourself later and cut yourself later. And it's for your own good. And I'll do it with a smile as long as you do what I say and do it with a smile and try your best. But if you're going to just go around and cause everybody else trouble and distract them and not pay attention to what's going on and hurt somebody because you dropped your hammer, dropped your tools, mm -mm. Mm -mm. last person in the world you want to have around is somebody who's not paying attention and being in the moment when they're carrying around things that can hurt other people. You take a two by four, eight foot long on your shoulder, walk down a little ways and somebody says something, you just swing around and whack about four people in the head with one of the two by fours that I got. Heavy as hell. Uh-uh, you're going to hurt people. You're going to break glass. And I have evidence of that. A broken piece of stained glass in my own personal house that nobody seemed to know how it happened. Nobody ever knows how it happened. If you didn't see it or hear it, the person in the woods, they didn't either. If it happened, they don't know nothing. Eh, it happened to me again. Okay, I'm going to accept this, and I'm going to turn it off. Ah, I can figure that one out. Isn't that cool? I'll call them back. Whew, three more earthquakes since I started talking in California and in Oklahoma. So what we're watching as we go along in this really cool time is that as we slow down from 700 kilometers per second on this wind speed on the surface, we go from having it six... Um, atmospheric storms, which means when your gauges show that you're in the red for a four-hour period, that's that's a storm. And it's been at the sixes, which is not a big storm. We can go up to nines, at which point everything is gone or blacked out. But the pressures we're getting right now are steady. 10, 12 times the normal density that we get at uh, double and change the wind speeds um, on the surface of our shield, Scotty. And that's from the front and the back. These are tenuous times when it comes down to predicting weather. 
Some of you probably don't like what I'm saying. Oh, it's the same person again. Hello, goodbye, I'm online. You think they understood that? That's polite when you're in a hurry. Um, so what I want to try to get across to everybody right now is that I would suggest you move quickly for what you want to do and position your butts as well as you can in the place you want to position that with the friends you want to have. And that's why I want to expedite this. Get the people on board. Get them over here. Ten people at a time each two-week period so you can help each other load up as fast as you can and get the heck on back to Dallas or wherever you're going to go ahead and start on your plan. If you get back here for more, we get you more. But you want to get in here and get at least one or two. And here's the issue. And that's why I posted this little cartoon. I've actually got the, the ones on, you know, where they're actually done on a computer. The bids like that, that Brad used to use to bid people's houses. And you'll find that a house this size, this is for a 12 by 20, which is a commonly requested size. If you want to go ahead and have this, but when you come here, and this is part of it, you get to see in a blue moon and in the Vicky 2, what a 12 by 20 looks like. And Vicky 1, a 10 by 17. And the mascot, a 10 by 16. And um, it, the idea behind each one of these is you feel the size, you see the loft, you see the way it's built, how space magic, how it feels. Because one is a 7 by 9, and it's one of the biggest feeling ones there is. It's got the shower, got a little kitchenette, it's got a second floor with a loft in it, and I extend 6 foot 4 in a second floor. Fold-out porch using barn hinges, all sorts of techniques. The other one that's most popular of all is the ginger swan, and it's 80 square feet. And you get to stay in it. It's got a balcony on the second floor. It's got a, um, a hammock on the second floor, so you can sleep three or four people in that thing. Why is that important? The tinier house you manage to build that works really well, feels really comfortable, allows you lots of storage, it means you can build more of them. Even building more I mean, is important because that's a bedroom. That's your master suite. You don't spend much time in there. You're going to go out and work every day. You're going to go out and help plan. You're going to go help do things because if you don't, unlike being able to sit in front of a TV and relax for 12 hours because you worked eight of them and you had to eat, pee, take showers and stuff like that before you sit in front of the TV and go to bed at night. 12 hours of the average day is wasted. Okay, think about this for a second, folks. Seven days a week, 24 hours a day, you got 160, what, four, 168 hours, depending on how you want to calculate your time you can use. Now, if you go ahead and waste eight of them a day or seven of them a day or six of them a day to sleep in a week, that's 36 to 49 hours, leaving you about 120 hours a week. Yeah, I know you're having trouble keeping up. Pause. Go back. Play it again. I don't have time. I'm trying to go ahead and teach you something. In that 120-hour week, you work 40 hours. What are you doing with the other 80 hours, guys? Time is important at this moment. If you got people you love, if you got people you want to go ahead and do something for, you better get around doing it. You think it's getting better. Don't keep fooling yourself. If you're depending on the government to come to you, guess what? Uncle Biden and Aunt Commie? Good luck! After they decommission the police and go ahead and make it impossible for you to get any assistance from anybody anyway, except the brown shirts, you're going to have a problem. So, if you don't make plans now for the family you love, the ones you know, you might have a problem in the future. Why? Because it is not going back to where it was. You don't believe it, and they'll let you out of your house. Go look. Texas, we just took the masks off. We're allowed to go ahead and open full. How many small businesses made it? How many small businesses can fill their refrigerators and their walk-in coolers again? How many small businesses have that kind of change left over when all of a sudden you can get it, but the government's going to own your business if you screw up the next time because you're going to have to sign everything you got over. If you don't make the payments, oh, well, they may, they're going to forgive it. They're going, what if they don't forgive it? What if it's commie and bid on over there and all of a sudden there's no bid on, it's just commies? And what do you think going to forgive? Owning your business? That's how you spell communism. No small businesses. All big. You go here, we ration you. We determine what you get. Oh, to get out of my Michigander nasal voice and to go ahead and say this so you understand it. I love you all very dearly. The humans that have a positive filament that are doing wonderful things that are trying to help others out right now. I will shed millions and millions in windows, doors, assets, wood, siding, and everything else, but you got to be realistic. It is not to give you all a bunch of shit to take home and stack up and brag about. It's to do something with. If this doesn't work, I got nothing else. My little part. What can I do? Act like a crazy person. Try to tell people. Wake up. No, not the woke out there and cancel culture and stop dialogue and censor everybody's got anything else. That's not woke up. That is deadhead zombie sleep. 
oh, I'm going to piss people off. I'm sorry. No. I'm sorry that more people aren't pissed off at seeing it. They won't let anybody see it. Otherwise, it'd piss more people off. It's called provoking people into thinking. I know. Dangerous thing. If they're not ready for it. So, here's the issue. People don't understand. This list that I posted on here for you to look at, that I'll post on this when I'm done. It calculates both what this would weigh and what it might cost. And that's assuming you can buy it, find it in one place at one time. And you can't. I know. I used to have the business a long time ago. I worked with Brad. He had it all stacked up. That's why you're going to get it. Now, the weight is what you're going to have to carry home. How much does it weigh? Oh, I don't know. I want a 12 by 20 house. I'm going to come get four of them. Are you really? And what are you going to bring? Uh, I got my half done pickup and I got me a 16 foot trailer. Yeah, you sure you do. It's education time. That's what this is. As I keep trying to educate people about logistics, A, what do you really need? Ah, everything you give me. No, I don't think that's a good attitude. What do you need to grow? a village as quickly as possible with the best people you can find. A, you don't need to build a bunch of bigger houses when you need some smaller houses and you need only a couple bigger houses, such as a house you might congregate in and get together in and talk, a community meeting center, that's a bigger house. And if you ain't got a big crowd, it doesn't need to be a very big house. I built churches and chapels, which you can go online and see I've designed. They're only 12 by 20 and they'll seat 24 to 30 people and have a wedding with a, yes, a wedding inside side by side, a couple walking down to the front and making a commitment in my world to Weblock. Weblock is two souls bonding together for eternities of spiritual, you know, not necessarily a wedlock contract on the planet Earth where you can divorce somebody and take everything they own because you are temporarily associated with them. Some people will understand what I mean. So, the point of this is, let's just say I want a 12 by 20. That's the main meeting house to start in. We need that. I'm okay with that. It's going to be a chapel. I'm okay with that as long as I see what the big plan is. So, draw it up. Make a cartoon. Why do you think I'd do it this way? So that everybody else can feel comfortable doing, well, I can't get on a computer and do it. Well, can you get a pencil and paper? Is anybody in your group capable of drawing? Can they write? Can somebody do an essay? Can somebody draw out a picture of how you're going to plan it out? Because if nobody in your group can do these things, then you haven't got a chance of succeeding once you get the materials. Who in your group is your plumber? Who's your electrician guy that's going to keep you from killing yourself trying to wire something? You have no business wiring. These are things that have to be considered before you go off on the great caravan of carrying off five houses of this size. Because I'm going to tell you now why that's going to be so hard. First of all, how many of you have ever done a material takeoff off of a blueprint or a plan so as to know how much you're going to need a material on the walls, on the ceilings, on the floors, on the subfloor, if you're going to use a subfloor, on the interior walls, on the exterior siding, how much trim, how much loft, how many 4x6s or 4x4s, depending on the quality of them and the span. How big is it going to span? The longer it has to span, the bigger the beams have to be. The bigger the beams have to be, that changes how far you can put it from your floor to ceiling. Is it being built for short people? If it's being built for people under six foot, wow, it's easier. If it's being built for people at six foot nine, it's a pain in the neck because all of a sudden now I got to add all that somewhere for them not to bang their head or put a sign on here and put pads just in case. So all these are variables on how much it's going to cost you to put these little houses together. If you live in Munchkinville and every one of you is under five foot eight, under five foot six, and you want to go ahead and build it so anybody by the tall comes around, they bang their head chasing you down the hallways, hey, I'm all for that. Nobody said you have to build eight foot tall ceilings so somebody can chase you. Build small ones. Preferably in the ground because it doesn't count. It's not taxable. It stays cool. 55, 60 degrees. You put your little house on the front and let your tunnel go in the back. Find that cave. That's my basement. Now, I'm going to spin through a couple of these things real quick. This is a 240 square foot house, been requested, for example. Uh, we're going to come out there. We're going to pick this up. We're going to do this. Uh, there's going to be three of us. 
And we're going to come out and do the four days, which I covered the other day, what those are. If you didn't listen to that yet, if you didn't listen through the whole thing to finally get to the end of it, where that's at, you're probably not going to be one of the people who get all this, I think, oh, I did add it up. There's wholesale, there's retail, there's what can you do with a package, what's it worth when you put it together, all these variables on value. In this day and age, I priced all this as if it was um, five, six years ago. And lumber hadn't gone up a dime. That's what this stuff would cost in those days, in those dollars. Except, if you haven't noticed, it's gone up. Lower the ceilings, absolutely. For, for heating, for cooling, you put your bedroom upstairs, your loft upstairs, and it's a lower ceiling, and that way you go upstairs and it stays warm at night. If you want to cool, you use the Venturi effect. You open your windows up at the top, you open your windows at the bottom, you get an airflow, it constantly cools. These are the things that took me 10 years to figure out how to design. It's called space magic because it cools itself. It stays warm. You can build it with least amount of wood, least amount of parts, least amount of things that you have to do to make it possible to have living spaces and build them as fast as you can in quality. And don't worry about perfection, but make them beautiful art pieces that you can live in. Living art. Some people call them uh, jewelry box houses because you build everyone like it's a jewelry box. My goodness, you only got two doors. I mean, make your hardware incredible. And trust me, when people come in, we're going to have little bonus parties at the end. You did a good job of doing your drawings, and, you got your, and it looks great. You get bonuses. What are the bonuses? Oh, I got some incredible. It's called estate, real estate jewelry, because it goes on your real estate. Yeah, your house. It's beautiful doorknobs and keyhole covers and all sorts of beautiful stuff. So... The idea, um, yeah, underground is larger area for everything. See, on my, in Texas, Xavier, okay, Neumeyer. Okay, it's a German last name, but I'm going to guess the front end of it's not. That's somebody's mix in, uh, anyway. Okay, um, in Texas, if it's a ground, in the ground, it's a hole. If it's a hole, it's not taxable as a house. See, up north, they have anything as a house as a basement. Basement counts. They tax it. In Texas, it's just a hole in the ground because you can't keep water out of most holes in the ground. In Texas, it rains too much. So basements flood all the time. They're not an asset unless you like a swimming pool in the basement that stinks. Yeah. Sounds delicious, doesn't it? So, fortunately... My property is an example of how you go ahead and create that and make sure the water always runs away. So if you go underground, which you have to do in the coming times, if you can possibly do it, because it also gives you constant control of temperature. It gets you out of noxious fumes. If there's a volcano went off and there's sulfur laden gas blowing along like it did in the other days in the past, and you breathe it in, you die. So you want to stay down in those holes and look for days that there's not a big old cloud coming through out of the woods. These are things to know if you haven't watched and read history. This happens every few hundred years when the sun and things like this, the earth goes. In fact, Iceland, by the way, you might pay attention. It's been 8,000 years since it got this active. It's been 800 years since this volcano that they're expecting to blow off any minute because it's now doing harmonic tremors. Wong, 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 wong. So we're going to be going off with lava, absolutely. And the question is whether it's going to be a big blast or not. If you want us to be a big blast, just go to... A couple of them, like Cinnabon, they just lot. I mean, literally, if you want to talk about what people do to the atmosphere, you got to go watch Cinnabon yesterday going off. I mean, oh my God, I've never seen in my entire life that much of a mountain take off into the air and look so solid in the air that I couldn't drive a truck through it, I swear. It is staggering. And when it comes down, you don't want to be under it. Just like my Etna. Dropping mud all over, miles and miles away when that cloud finally starts to settle back out. Nasty, woohoo! But don't worry, life is short if you don't get out of the path of those things. Now, what's that particular matter I mentioned about? Well, that dust, all that particular matter when it comes down that I mentioned is really fine, almost glass fine sometimes, very dangerous. You look at that windy.com map and think if you want to be up there on that plane right now, up there on the coast as it comes in, or anywhere actually up in the northern tier, <laughs> north of Texas. Because if you notice that particular matter, it's a problem. It's a big problem. And the 2.5, that's what you need to pay attention to, not the 10, the 2.5. Just a little bit of advice if you just want to go off and wander. Meantime, flooring. You're going to need 240 square feet, but you always got to figure a waste factor. So he's going to be, I'm going to give you some quantities of everything you're going to need. I got them all listed on here. If you've taken the time to go ahead and download this, print it out, take a picture of it, so you can follow me, 
you get an A. Nobody's got it. Okay. Renee, I'd love to have your son's health and everybody else. We need to have kids doing this. I mean, the kids, if they learn it now, they'll be such wizards at this. I could teach the Pythagorean theory to a kid in a heartbeat if I tell them that's how you figure out how much roof area you need. That's how you figure out most of the things that you need. You can figure it all out just knowing that simple A squared plus B squared equals C squared formula. And then how to work it to get everything you need. Simple stuff, but... Nobody teaches it in school anymore. So on a house, 12 by 20, that's 240 square feet. And meters, for a lot of you out in other places, we don't do that here. We just do stupid American measurements. We don't do metric like we should. And so I'm unfortunately unable to go ahead and just give you actual accurate numbers. But I will say that if you divide by 9, roughly, 240 square feet you know, gives you square meters. And so if you want to use that approximate number, you can. Okay. So 30 square meters of house. And you're going to have to translate the rest of these. I'm not going to do this. And in, in, I've got people from all over the world watching. And it's not that I don't feel for you guys. It's just that I can't possibly do. That's like speaking a couple languages. And I'm already speaking one. And I'm speaking it so fast. I'm sorry for you that I don't speak English easily. I hope that you're subtitling this. I'm supposed to be, but it doesn't seem to show up on mine. Okay. That is. High ceilings are a southern thing, yes. But in the wintertime, when you get cold down here, that is. I have those high ceilings in a few of my buildings that I had, my houses I had. And, and if you want to get up on a ladder and sit up near the ceiling, you can stay warm. Otherwise, you're going to freeze your buns off by the time you get that heat down close enough to your butt to go ahead and heat it. Because you got to heat eight feet from the 12-foot ceiling down to your butt before your butt gets hot. So your feet freeze, your butt freezes, and anything else in the lower extremities... Unless you get up on that ladder. But in the summertime, yeah, it blows out the heat. It's easier to put two stories in that. Yeah, that's what I do. Because in the same 14 feet, I can put a whole house. Instead of 12 feet for one floor of one room. And this is what we learn as we go along and do this. So, flooring, 240 square feet. Okay, plus 15%, because you have a lot of waste in flooring typically. You want that to be your best wood. So you always got to figure a waste factor for whatever your actual measurement is. I take 15 or 10%, depending on what it is. And depending on how I'm using it, how fine it's going to want to be, and what the perfectionist is. If I was selling it to somebody who's a perfectionist, you might have to have a higher waste factor, or you have to look through it and be more careful. Water and coffee. Water and coffee. Hopefully, that'll be a balance out. Now, three pounds. In longleaf pine per square foot because it's four pounds. Of, um, we have board foot, a board foot is one inch thick by 12 by 12 measurement, 12 inches by 12 inches. That's considered to be a board foot in a measurement, but in a uh, square foot it means it's been milled. It's the process of milling, we planed off the top, planed off the bottom, planed the sides to give it a tongue and groove shape to use it for flooring or shiplap or whatever the name, which is terminology, which is another class, not this one. So we can identify what T111 siding is, or T107 siding is, or T105 siding. Whatever one you want to use, if you know the name of it, we can talk the same. Otherwise, these are all like talking Greek to you. But for flooring, that you can understand. It's got a little tongue and groove, so it sticks together. And you nail that so you don't see them. And it doesn't snag your socks and stuff like that. So flooring, 240 square feet. Typically, you put that on a subfloor up north because you need a second layer of wood. But in longleaf pine in Texas, I can lay it diagonally and not need a subfloor if I space my joists and do it right. You have a little bit of a waste factor, but you can do one layer of flooring. I know you can do it because I've taken up houses that have been built here for 120 years, and they did it, and it worked just fine. Now, the problem comes in if you don't put something underneath it is to go ahead and insulate it. I highly recommend blowing on isonine. It's an uh, isocyanate that doesn't outgas, and it stops 92 to 94% of the heat and it does it quickly. Now, you can use several kinds. Up north, it's different than down south. This is not applied to the north. This applies to the south. Gerard, do you recommend shed house or just raw tiny house in Texas? Um, you know, I, I like shed roof if you want to go ahead and capture the rainwater, but it's no style at all. I think it's the ugliest thing in the world. I have one I built one time because somebody wanted to build that way, and you'll never see a picture of it anywhere. It was so ugly. I couldn't even put a picture of it on my site. I would not even have it credited to my name. I'd rather have some style. Most like it raw. That's true. Um, flushing toilets or compost toilets. Well, let me put it this way. In Texas, if you have running water into the house in order to have yourself a normal flushing toilet, then you're required by law to have a septic system, which means you get into an engineer, perk test, and all sorts of other things. On the other hand, in Texas, if you happen to have walking water, which means I carry my five-gallon water in there and I have a composting toilet, I'm not required to have a septic. I can now have a composting toilet, which can be clay or 
shavings. And I've talked about this in other ones. I'm not going to go into this too far. I'm getting distracted. I don't put the bathroom in. I usually recommend if you're going to have one, have an RV toilet and a small black water tank. And that way you can go ahead and flush and keep all the people coming to visit on the B&B happy, but not have something where you can't take the black water tank away because that way you can beat the inspectors because it's a loophole because you're not dumping into a septic system. You're dumping into a portable black water tank and the portable black water tank then can be taken to the septic system or to the public sewer system if you've got an access so you can go ahead and pump it to them and give it to them as extra doo-doo for free. Normally, though, if you can use it for nutrients, there's all sorts of methodologies, which I cannot necessarily go into here. Because <sighs> you know I'm running out of air, can't you tell? Words. I'm going to run out of words soon, too. My, my dictionary is almost empty. There's lots of ways to go ahead and cure sewage issues. I'm not by any means going to advocate any one over the other one and where you're at to determine what you can do. Because if the authorities come in and say, no, you can't do it like they did on me once, and I had to walk around here for an hour and a half, Follow me around, five of them, trying to find what they said was a cesspool someplace. And unfortunately, when you get old like me and you get kind of senile, you have trouble remembering where you're going. You just keep going this way and that way. And they see everything in the world, but what they seem to want to see. And eventually, they just go home and think you're kind of a little bit goofballish. And they don't come back because you're just a goofball. And you know what? That works real good. Anyway, and I'm a goofball, right? So... Yeah, uh, yeah, I write that down. No, no, see, you hit pause, write a little bit, hit pause, write a little bit, hit pause. Okay, flooring, 240 square feet, plus 15% equals 260 square feet. 260 square feet at the measurements and everything I told you about for weight means it's going to be three pounds per square foot, means it's going to be 780 pounds of weight on your trailer already, just for the floor. Now, you're going to go ahead and put a subfloor. Now, I'll say, let's say it's a cheaper wood, two pounds to the square foot, same amount. Down here, I have subfloor, for example, 520 square pounds. Wow. All right. I'm already up to 1,200 pounds on my little, what, how big a trailer did you bring? Typical 16-foot trailer has two 3,500-pound axles. Total capacity is 77,000 pounds. Less the weight of the darn trailer sitting on top of the axles to start with. How big and how heavy is your trailer to start with? Is it pipe on the sides? Is it just square iron on the side? What's the gauge of the square iron? I have no clue. That's your job. And on top of that, what kind of ball? What's it rated for? How much weight can you pull? That's going to be a factor. Because when I get to the end of this, you're going to say, how much did that weigh? Oh, my God. My car didn't weigh but half that. That's an important point to know. What does your vehicle weigh that you'll pull this load with? Whew. I know. If you're not a mathematician, that's why I'm trying to give you this stuff, Elizabeth. And that's why group balls all over the place. Because why? Nobody's a mathematician. How are you going to know that Longleaf Pine weighs four pounds to the board foot? Unless you're an engineer. You aren't going to know. What's oak weigh to the board foot? You aren't going to know. How you figure board foot? You aren't going to know. So... That's why you come to these videos. Now, and you come here because I'm going to tell you, because I'm not going to let you leave and kill yourself. I'm going to tell you when you get here, oh, look, I know you want to take 18 houses home in one trip, but you can't do it. I'm going to tell you before you get here, actually, because if you come here thinking you're going to take 18 houses home, I already know you're a whack job and you're not going to come because you didn't pay attention. All right, that's flooring. That's just two layers of flooring. We're at 1,200 pounds. All right, lofts. We're not going to go into that yet because if we did, oh, we will. 160 square foot. How big is your loft? How's your design going to go? How big is your house? In this case, it's a 12 by 20. My loft and half the house would be 120 to 160 square feet. I build houses smaller than that, and they're better because I use the space better. The bigger you get, the more wasted space you get, believe it or not. So while I'm describing what this is in one house, I could be building two houses with the same amount of materials that would look like the kid or even, um, yeah, they'd look like the, the ginger swan. So those two, you go on Airbnb when you think about coming here and you look at all the cool houses you can stay in. That's one place to look. Or you go on Pinterest, you go anywhere in the world and look up these names and you will find them on the internet because they're all over the internet. Everybody in the world has used them and not given us a penny, one nickel for using my pictures all over the world. Okay. Long wall. What do you mean long walls? There's two long walls and a 12 by 20 house and assuming it's going to be eight foot tall on the sidewall although i prefer nine why because that gives me a foot of loft foot and a half of side loft before i actually go to my pitch and that allows me to put my mattress over there and put my feet on the mattress and not have my toes hit the ceiling it allows me to put my head over there and not have my nose on the ceiling because the ceiling goes up so close so by putting a seven foot at the most height of the second loft floor 
you are able to then come up at nine foot and have another foot and a half to two feet before you start to pitch your roof coming up. This gets you extremely valuable space up above. Now on the other side of it too is in a loft in Texas, if you have lower than a four foot six side wall on that loft, it's not living space, it's storage space. So you always want to make sure one side is lower than that and that way it doesn't get taxed as a house on the second floor. It's just storage space where you put a bedroom. Nice thing to store upstairs. Loophole, loophole, loopholeology. You know, guys, this is thousands and thousands of dollars of schooling you're getting. And what are you paying? Yeah, that's what I thought. All right. What's a long wall? Long wall is 8 by 20 in this case, or 9 by 20. We'll call it 8 by 20 to save you a little money, make a shorter house, whatever, and just keep the weight down by 10%. Still, 320 square foot just to put the long wall one side cladding on the interior in wood plus 10 percent smaller waste factor you can probably get around it i'm going to have less than that extra because i have windows and doors i'm assuming i don't have windows and doors so i'm keeping my waste factor minimum i got some extra wood left over for other things that might happen because it's salvage lumber 350 square foot at three pounds because it's gonna be good wood shiplap or something like that that's a thousand pounds more already i'm at two and a half 2500 pounds okay my end walls are likewise 8 by 12, assuming the same height, times 2, is 200 square foot times plus 10%, 220 square foot times 3 pounds, takes up 660 pounds more. Now, I didn't go ahead and do the interior wall and exterior wall both, so you can pretty much almost double that. Another 1,600 pounds, 1,700 pounds. So that's 3,400, 4,400 pounds. I got skins for the walls, two walls, on the... Yeah, two sides of two walls. Not even the other walls yet. I'm sense of the ceiling. I got to do that. That's another layer of cladding. Okay. How big is the ceiling? What's your pitch? How high is it? How far does it go over? What's your overhang? These are all variables on the next few numbers. How much decking do you need to go under your roof? That's another variable because your overhangs. I like a long overhang so the water doesn't come under the house. On some of the siding, you can cut your cost and speed it up if you want to use metal on the side. I've got 87,000 square feet of tin has to come off one of the buildings. So you can have tin siding like I did on the bathhouse. Go online, look at b, &B Airbnb, see our bathhouse. It's made with solid corrugate on the outside of it. It looks great. It looks like a fortress. It should be. Your bathhouse needs to be a kind of a fortress. Um, so what you want to do is go ahead and, and, and pay attention to the materials and speed you want to put them together with. Let's just say you're in a hurry and you think there's going to be a problem and you want to go ahead and get it done fast and you don't have a lot of skilled people. Then put metal on the outside of the building because guess what? It takes a beating. You can bang on it, rang, all sorts of things. And it takes the weather and it goes up fast and it's cheap and it's easy and you get a lot on a trailer and get a lot of buildings closed in and roofed in a hurry if you do these things. Now, on the roof, I'm going to say you're going to spend a lot of money. If you're going to spend anything, you want to spend it on the underlayment that goes underneath your metal roof. Underlayment. You want to use a self-sealing, it's not like a rubberized, sticky brown underlayment. So when you put it on, you peel it off, and you stick it to the roof. And that way, anything goes through it, a nail or a screw, it seals itself afterwards. Now, the beauty of it is it has a 30-year lifespan underneath your metal. So if your metal leaks, it really leaks through onto this stuff and runs off underneath your metal and goes someplace off the side of your roof anyway. So what the metal on the top is, and this is good when you're using older corrugated because you might have some extra holes, is that even if it leaks, it doesn't get into the house for 30 years just because the underlayment is so good. So if you have to replace it, you need to do something because it's worn out and it's rusting through, but it's not leaking, but you want to replace the metal. It's cheap to get more recycled metal if you have a good underlayment that seals your screws so they can't leak once they go through the underlayment. That's the secret of a non-leaking roof. Please pay attention to that. In the south, we have a special kind for hot, hot temperatures. In the north, they have one for cold. It's called ice. A Gracie makes one, and it's ice and fire. And that's the best you can buy, $160 a roll. But a roll is like two squares, I think. Average tiny house is two squares. That's cheap for 30-year freeze or fire protection. Then use your metal on it. Now, you can't do that on the walls. You need to use Tyvek, which is a, as a, a barrier for moisture. But I highly recommend you use the Radiant Barrier, which is twice as expensive, same size roll, twice the price. But you get one square instead of two. A square is 10 foot by 10 foot area. And on an average house, you're going to need three of them probably if you patch it right. 
but that gives you a radiant barrier, a luminized outer barrier that reflects 15% of the heat away from the interior of the house. If you do that with the metal on the outside, and because you're using corrugated, you have air in the corrugations that deflects, if you have airflow, the heat from getting through, and then hits the barrier. So you have double protection, and if you use isonine, two inches of isonine will block 92% of the heat for 48 hours, instead of some foam or some, some um, 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 carcinogenic glass fibers that have been able to be sold to everybody with labels saying they're carcinogenic, but still being sold because some companies have a lot of influence in the government. We won't go any further than that. But I will say this, you can use wool, you can use all sorts of things, but if you use anything that an animal would like to go ahead and nest in, they will nest in it. Rock wool, don't you ever use it, it cuts your lungs. My dad's uh, cancer actually was provoked over that. He went up there and got in his lungs and the razor edges of rock wool caused the tumors to break and cut. He started coughing up blood and that's how I found out we had the tumors. Um, so don't use rock wool, please. And don't use fiberglass. There's a bunch of things not to use. But you can go ahead and use them. Um, I, I do believe in isonine is my favorite one. Uh, there'll be a lot of controversy on this, but it doesn't outgas. There's no foam that you can get that's going to be better for two days later. There's nothing can hurt you, and it stays inert forever. You close it in the wall. It's great. Okay, that's my opinion. It's only an opinion. Everybody's got one of those the same as they got eyeballs. All right. Now, use your own discretion. If you got somebody nearby that can blow it, have them do it. Don't you dare buy your own. Don't buy it in little cans and spray it. It's too expensive. Get a pro to come in there with his $40,000 spray machine and hoses and crew that know what they're doing. They'll knock it out in a day. They cut off the edges. It's done. It's worth it. And they take all the risk. And the risk is if you get that droplet in you before it expands to six times its normal size, it's going to choke you to death. you got to know what you're doing. You got to clean the hoses. It's four thousand dollars in hoses to get to your gun. It's another thousand bucks, and as it leaked like it did for these guys one day, they came back after lunch and they had a foam, hard foam, and inside the middle of it was the gun. An hour and a half later, they got the gun back out. The owner wasn't very happy. They let it leak. They left it on. They didn't do what they're supposed to do, and that's why I never bought one of those machines. I ever wanted to have one of those machines. No, going on with that. You're responsible for the insulation. That's not part of your kit, your package. If you haven't gone back and watched the one about what's not included, please do. Because you're going to have to have some money to make these things happen. It's not like you can do this because you got a pack of cigarettes you're going to skip next week. No, you're going to take more money than that. You can't skip it. A uh, uh, cafe latte once a day. Like some of them go, oh, if you just skip this once a day. I used that sales technique a long time ago. I used to sell memberships in a spa. You can have health at the price of a cup of coffee a day. That's $30 a month. That's $330 a year. That turns into some change when you never come back to the club again, but you signed a contract. I also actually was a witness for the state attorney general's office when they prosecuted that Golden Life Fitness Center that went bankrupt not long after I was working for them for selling memberships and offering a guarantee that wasn't really a guarantee because they sold their contracts to the mafia for half the price at the end of the night and snorted up the rest of it in their limousine, which is why I quit. Crazy people in some of those businesses. Anyway, back to the real world. No, wait, you're not in the real world. <sighs> Roof decking, flooring. Now, I do want to say this. If you're going to floor your loft, you can do it with quality wood and not have to use a real good heavy thickness. Anytime you use heavy, good wood, you can span longer distances. You can do things you can't do with new wood. All right, done. My lips are getting dry right there. Okay, now, windows, doors. Hey, they're not heavy, but they take up a lot of space. And if you don't pack them right, they won't look the same when you get to where you're going, particularly the windows. I'm really fond of old hand-blown glass, the waves in it, and the dimples. That means it was pre-1919, it was poured after 1919 on molten tin changed everything but before that is bubbles blown in a big pit put on a table cut the ends off cut the side lay it out flat make your piece of glass and the little 12 year olds kept bringing the coal in that the other 12 year olds pulled out of the mine someplace else and they stuck the fires so that the 16 year olds could go ahead and do this stuff this kind of work until they're 18 20 30 40 years old and finally just pretty much died from all the problems that come with that Being a 12-year-old, pulling the coal out of the mine. Um, 
a little bit different in the old days. So, that said, oh yeah, by the way, what am I putting on my mouth? I'm putting chicken poop. Chicken poop. Oh, you can't read it. It's backwards. Anyway, it says chicken poop. Oh, and it's 100% pure, free-range chicken poop. Lip junk. Put it on your lips. You know, I probably wouldn't have been so... Uh, made in Kansas. It's American-made. Hey, guys. So you now know what I just put on my lips was chicken poop. Luckily, I'm just a fantasy character. And somebody's making fantasy chapstick for fantasy characters. But you probably can get this, too. I didn't actually even know that you... I had that up here. Okay. Onward with chicken lips, I go. Windows. Typically, you want to have one window for next to your door on the front. You want to have one window on one side and need enough wall space to put your stairs in and have some wall space. So on the other side, you might put one or one window over there or two windows, depending on how big the house is going to be. It's a 12 by 20, so you might have one lot of light. Now, on the back, you're going to have a kitchen window. You're going to have a little tiny bathroom window, typically. And upstairs, you're going to have a window on the top of the loft, and you're going to have a window at the very front, figuring out how you're going to open and close that so you get airflow going out the top to cool them. Whew. Okay. Keep me from licking my lips, yeah. Cage-free, no less. Isn't that cool? Okay. Um, I actually like old wood windows. You can weatherize them. You can weather stripping on the side of them. You actually make them very weather tight if you want to. And they found out that it is actually more economical because you don't have to make the glass and because you don't have to cut the wood. And so if you go ahead and weather strip them, you can actually go ahead and get a longer lifespan, um, efficiency-wise and lifespan, out of not having to make more windows because the windows you're using are already 100 years old. Now, I do have a bunch of new old stock. What that means is that in 1963, a gentleman in Galveston was across the street as a dentist, and he watched J.F. Smith and Brothers, who was a millwork distributor, catalog distributor in Texas from the 1800s into 1963, when they were going to empty out their warehouse into the dump. And this doctor, in his wonderful, glorious stewardship, took responsibility. And for the next 43 years, this man moved this stuff three different times and finally bought a house to put it in, three bedroom, two bath, on the side of railroad tracks where nobody would want to live, but this hardware. And he stuffed it, all the bedrooms full, and then he had a, a barn on a ranch nearby. And in the barn, he stuffed all these sashes, window sashes, all the way up 15 foot high. And critters were living in them, snakes were living in them. They were like four or five stacks deep. And he was in an old folks' home finally, him and his wife, they were in their 80s. 83, I think he was. And the kids wanted to sell it all off and cash in and help pay for everything. And they were going to burn it so they could sell the place to clean it up. And they said, you interested? And I went out there and I paid them like $5,000 a long time ago. And went out there with several trailers and just packed this stuff out of there and packed this stuff out of there and brought it home and stuffed it in warehouses so I could be the, the steward for the next 20, 30, 40 years. And um, it was great because while we were doing it, and he knew, the old man knew, that he'd been taken care of. He passed. Happy. So, what we're trying to do is make sure that happens again, and again, and again. Okay, you're going to create these outposts. And you're going to accumulate all these wonderful, wonderful materials. Of all these old timers. And what you want to do is turn them into houses. And turn them into things so we don't have to cut more trees down. And use the hardware. I use barn hinges to hang porches that we... Fold them, put the roof up, lock it in. You're going to transport it, pull out the lock and bolts, fold it again on the same barn hinges that we used 120 years ago for the barns. I don't have to make new metal. I didn't have to go out and mine it. I didn't have to make iron. I didn't have to go out in the forge and shape it. And it's a higher quality than anything I could possibly make today. And I can go out and get it for free off of any old barn if they let me take down the barn. And they'll let me take down the barn because it's just a nuisance. It's a danger. It's a tax liability. It's everything they don't want and everything I need. Or once needed. One you can actually see on TV, right? In a barn. A big old barn. We took it down. Yeah, for the History Channel. They said, hey, you got any barns? I said, no, got no barns. They said, well, we wish you did because we want to do a little video. I mean, a, little mo a little show. Sure as heck, next day, who calls? A lady 15 minutes away with a barn. Hey, I got a barn. Let me call. Yeah, you need a barn? I got a barn. Next thing you know, we had the kids and we had a team together. And we went out there and did a seminar on how to tear a giant barn down. Big barn. Barn, probably 40 feet to the peak. 
And you can see me because I'm the one that took the whole ridge off because that's the most dangerous job is to be the guy on the top with your crotch in the ridge going down, bouncing over the nails and pulling all that ridge cap off. And then once you get the ridge cap off, then you pull those long sheets off and then you got a ladder. It's easy after that. But that first initial part, you can slide down 30 feet of roof and fall off that 16 foot edge and you might get hurt. And so you don't want to send people up there. They're going to get hurt because if you do, the landowner's going to be mad. Insurance company's going to be mad. The guy who falls down is going to be mad until he goes and gets his lawsuit and his attorney's going and find out how rich he's going to be and how he's going to own that place. And then he's going to be happy, but everybody else is going to be mad. Mm -mm. I always looked at it like, if I fall, I can't sue myself. Uh-oh. Guess what? You're not going to get to talk to me again. Hello. Goodbye. Wonder why he can't even get through. He's always making this damn video. Man, you know why I can't make this for kids, don't you? All right. I got through windows, doors. You know what? You only need two. Bathroom door, kitchen door. Kitchen door. You don't need a kitchen door. Uh, where else you need a door to? Front. Get in and out of the house. That's two whole doors. Wow. Now, if you want to make a cool house, you take some more of the, the kind of junker doors and use them for a, a wainscot, like a, a paneled wainscot, a paneled bottom on your wall. It looks great. And you take a couple of cheesy doors and you lay them on their side and, and you got panel wall. You want to do the whole house indoors like I do want. We're going to have fun there too. Just the whole house, ceilings and walls all made out of doors. So it's all paneled. You just have to position them right and put your windows in the right places and you design around the doors. But this kit, there's only two of them. Now, if you're going to get two houses, then I got to have two front doors and you don't usually have a door for the bathroom in a tinier house. We have curtains going into the shower. Um... But there's no, no second door inside of a house that's only 70 square feet or 80 square feet. But at 160 square feet, we have a bathroom door. At 170 square feet, we have a bathroom door. All the big ones, we have bathroom doors. So, next, cabinet wood, bath walls, shower wall tiles. I make a roofing shingle shower wall. You can see it in a bunch of the videos. You can see it in all the houses I have online that I design that have old roofing shingles from a hundred years of being on the roof. They interlocked. They were galvanized. They got dings on them from all the hail, but otherwise they're perfectly good. They're not even rusted. They had so much zinc in the steel and the metal back then, and they made it last for a lifetime, except they meant a real lifetime, not a mouse's lifetime. Oh, you didn't know that? Lifetime guarantee in America, if you use the mouse lifetime for a measuring device, it works very good. Fine print. If you can find it, it's written so mice can read it, not humans. It's fine print at the bottom. All right. Roof and metal, which I highly recommend you make as much as you can out of roof and metal. You can put the, the whole village together much faster. And I've got about a corrugated. I've got V-groove. I've got some that look like brick. I've got some that look like rock. I've got Oh, decorative metal. I love using decorative roof metal. And I've got about 4,000 square feet of different types of decorative roof metal that if you coat it properly and put it along overhang, you can use that to make some really cool upper second floor ornamentation in metal. And it's fast, it's easy, and beautiful. If you have to change it out somewhere down the road, you can change out a two foot by four foot piece of metal pretty easily and not very expensively. Um, trumpet. Oh, cool, cool, cool. Um, I want more people trying to work with the songs, the Song of Salvage, and do some more versions of it if possible. I'd like to see a hundred versions of the Song of Salvage. It's a poem I wrote. If you haven't listened to it online, I know I, I don't mention it very often. My son did a version of the Song of Salvage. And another young gentleman I mentored for many years who did a lot of the videos for me and uh, took away a love story for me and did a bunch of other things for me. Um, he has another version that's very good. That's the El Campo Expedition. And it's a very jazzy Johnny Cash rhythm with the Song of Salvage words put into it as a, um, a very legal, um, what do they call that? Uh, when you make fun of something else. Anyway, it's a really good tune. Um, so after I went through all the list of what you got to have, if you can remember all that, you can go back and look at it, go back and get it on here. I'm going to have it posted. All right, now, you'll notice that next to it on the left-hand side, I've got a bunch of prices. And that would be prices if you were to come in here and buy it, and I was to give you a heck of a deal, and you say, I want a package just like his. Because I want to build one just like his. And I say, I know I'm giving you yours. Yeah, I know I'm going to pay for it. Well, how much is it going to cost? Well, because you know whoever it is I'm doing it with, I'm going to give you um, a value. It's probably 50% of what it costs you 
normally. Because this kit, for example, this package could probably build two houses with a little bit of differences. I'd have, I'd rather have me two, the kids or two of the um, something else, because that's two people could live. And I got one house to come and eat the kitchen anyway. They don't need a kitchen. Um, they just need a kitchenette, a little place they can go and make coffee in the morning or something, hang out for the weekend, drink tea, make some eggs in the morning, something like that. They don't need a full oven, the stove, all that stuff, and a little front tiny refrigerator if they got electricity, that kind of stuff. Those are the tiny houses. So, as you grow this, and the further you put them out there, the less electricity you want to have on, where you can do solar panels or wind or water power. There's all sorts of techniques, and this is what we want to share with each other. Everybody's community is going to come up with these ways of doing this, and you share it with the other ones. It's a networking thing. You've got an expert, and he's just incredible. He's done this, he's done that. Well, send him over here. We'll take care of him. We'll treat him like a good person that deserves respect. And give him some sort of benefits. What can we do? What does he need? What does he want? Barter, barter. <coughs> if you work with me to create this then you become part of it then you're one of the solutions I don't have to be here to hold it together I just have to be here to go ahead and stimulate the manifestation of this in a thousand different petals on a flower I'm not out there to be every petal I don't want to be all the same color petals I want to have a beautiful flower made up of all different kinds of petals and variations of what you can do with salvage. And why you do it for good reasons, that's the condition. For truth, for honor, for your belief that maybe your God is calling you to do this for good reasons, not for just sheer profit and getting over on everybody else. And if that's what you're doing for it, I'm sorry, you're in the wrong place. And hopefully I'll screen you and stop you before you get to the point of taking a bunch of my stuff away just to go ahead and use it to take advantage of other people. Oh, we did make up a very nice little form to go ahead and be able to kind of select the things about people as you just go along and ask questions and they get through, well, I want to know. Are they truthful? No. Okay, that's a big old red gash. And um, are they, do they do drugs? Yes, they're actively doing meth. Okay, we got that one on our list now. And so you go through and qualify the people that you want to have visit. Now, you may want certain kinds of people, and if you do, you can fill the list out the way you want to, but at least it gives you a criteria that you can go ahead and value the kind of people you want to have in your community. And I'm praying that most of the people that take these want good people in their communities and they want to create communities where good people can go and get together and make this happen. And it is possible. There's one young man out there right now. I mean, you want to go ahead and pay attention. He's got land out there. and um, um, He's got uh, out in the mountains. He's got no restrictions to speak of. And he could use the help. He's got a broken back. He's got kids. He's got the reason to help some people out. He's got tools. He's got trucks. He's got all sorts of equipment. Tim, you'll see him on here. I want you guys to meet each other. I want you to create your your community. Beautiful mountains out there in Virginia area. You ought to get in touch. He's got acreage out there in the mountains. He's got acreage that's got utilities. He's got all sorts of parts and pieces. He's sca scavenged and saved. Just luck didn't turn his way. He's in trouble. Physically. His wife's in trouble. Unfortunately, nowadays, due to medications and stuff like that, she's had an early stroke. They got babies. So you can help people out. You can work with them, and they'll work with you. Fill in the gaps. Some people help other people walk. Some people help other people talk, because they can't talk for themselves. Some people help other people express themselves through music and heal, through music or sound, through touch, through what they can grow, the food, that they can cook, knowing what somebody's allergy is or what they need. The herbs they can add that might help them. Only through the villages, only through the elders, only through the magic of the past. And I say magic in this sense. You have to delineate between science that says it's not possible and what really happens and give it a name sometimes. Phenomenal. Miraculous. I like those. We can do these things. I've seen it happen. I've seen phenomena. I always answer the question, what are you, are you damn phenomenal, man? I can't make phenomena happen unless I can be phenomenal. I used to begrudge anybody even to say I was having a great day because there's always something I could complain about if I wanted to, and I did. Or be angry about. Mm -hmm. 
And then you get to the point that you're just thrilled to death every day when you get up. The last thing you have to do is get angry if you can help it. You want to be in that love state. You want to care. You want to help people out. Give as much as you can give. Trust me. There is nothing better we can do. And how do I instill that thought in others? How do I get them to do it? I'm going to give millions of dollars away. I'm going to make cute little cartoons to help people smile and teach kids. Maybe teach kids. And adults that need it. That have matured. To care about other people yet. And now they're getting the calling. And now they're paying attention. Now they're going, well, maybe I don't have to sit on my dumb ass on the couch and watch TV all day long. Maybe I can get up and do something with part of that other 12 hours a day that I've been wasting. And if enough people do that, that virus of human consciousness gets hold and the peace virus all of a sudden sets in. Everybody starts doing that. Peace will set in because you know what? There's going to be herd immunity to bullshit by politicians who take you for a ride while you sit on your couch and watch multimedia feed you a line of crap you think is candy and eat it like nobody's business and get fat and sick and go to big pharma and doctors to heal you. Oh yeah, that's in the book, isn't it? Yeah. Or is that reality? Am I getting this mixed up? Some days, huh? some days, please be aware. Nobody human is going to stop what's happening right now. That new hurricane they just spotted with all satellites and showed there's actually a hurricane from NATO of plasma over the North Pole is making it turn wonderful purple. And yeah, it's just part of the evidence of the energy that is taking hold of our planet. And you can go two ways with this energy. You can go up, 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 positive, light up, be, become that being that we need you to be. I say we, W-I-I, all of us eyes, me, these two eyes, M-I-I, that eye, the one that's looking that way. Me and all of the yous that I don't want to be my enemy and divisive. I want us to be we, all of us working together. If we do, it's possible to make a world union of beings in a heartbeat. We can have this around the world because a small, tiny, little, harmless language can implant in 13 words of wibbly and wub how to communicate, how to go ahead and let everybody know you're a wubber. You believe that it's possible, that you haven't given up hope yet. That's all it means. You smile about it. It's not like you're a religion, this religion, that. You just haven't given up hope that there's a peaceful solution somehow. And I mean by not giving up hope, I mean you're still actively doing something other than bitching, griping, trolling, moaning, groaning, complaining, and stopping the rest of us from doing what maybe could be done. In other words, as the saying goes, lead, follow, or get out of the darn way so that somebody could put a light at the front of this darkness and guide us the best we can get through there. Nobody is going to stop the volcanoes. Nobody's going to stop the earthquakes. Nobody's going to stop the weather. It's how we deal with it that is important now, not what caused it, Uncle Gore. Humans have no control over this situation. And I don't care if you have Trump in there, if you have bid on or whoever you have in there, we do not control the Beaufort gyre which is now releasing the water, the fresh water that is diluting the very thing we said was going to happen sooner or later. It is happening. We have changes going on that are so far beyond the expectations of anybody like myself in 6th grade, 7th grade, 8th grade in 1960s. No. We're there. In Orwellian 1984, is it possible? Can we control their mind with frequency? Can we make them sick? Can we convince them through propaganda? Can we go ahead and check their thoughts? Can we control where they go? Can we determine who's normal and who's not? And how do we determine that? And who gets to stick around? Gee, that used to be science fiction. What do you think? Does it sound like science fiction? Wait a second. It's fantasy. You're on Fantasy News. Salvage. SurrealSalvage.com. I own the name. Nothing's happening there, but we're not ready yet. We're close. Isn't it just about surreal out there? Yeah. 
Thank you so much, guys. You know, I really want to thank everybody because of this. The few of you that get here, that's all there is. Yeah. Unfortunately, what's actually happened is that we've pretty much been shut down. In that sense, nobody gets to see us. So, if you want to get the word out, if you want to share, certainly appreciate it. And, uh, not that I know it'll do any good because a lot of you can't even share it. They'd block that. But if you can, I sure would appreciate it because ultimately all we're trying to do is give away opportunity, empower people near you to make a pure salvage outpost possible so you can go over there and learn how to do all this stuff and make yourself goodies and ship some stuff in from Texas and be part of a community. Please, help out those people near you. Help Tim out. Help out any number of them that are on here, my goodness. New York, go up there. He's trying to do something up there. He's got himself five acres out there. You can get on there, but you got to get on there quick because on some of these things, you got a certain amount of window and time. The door of opportunity only stays open for so long. And then next thing you know, it's like, what? what happened? I missed it. Yeah. That's what happens. And so what you want to try to do is think about this, okay? Please. Imagine, if you will, a young boy about 15 years old named That's Darby Leddick. Envision this boy living in the 1960s, and for many reasons... For many reasons, people. More... What I thought at 15, and what I think now, if I'd have said at 15, these things would happen. This would be the world we live in. They'd lock me up in a cell. Call me crazy. Conspiracy... Oh, wait a second. Oh, they didn't lock me in a cell, but everything after that, I was going to say they did that already. They beat me up, chased me out. Yeah, if you read the book of Wibbley and Wub, you'll find out it's not a good thing to go talk about these things, about communicating through touch, about being able to communicate mind to mind. Wibbling, wobbling through touch, wibbling mind to mind, a thought, a web transmitted from one person to another. Or getting on the internet and communicating with somebody on the other side of the world instantaneously. Did that happen? I think so. One day. So, the idea is, what are we going to do, guys? So, I have an idea. My best to let you see this love I have. Story. You're part of the story, all of you. Thank you, Bats. See y'all later.